Good evening to you, my dear friends. I'm happy that we are together again. Let's deepen another article of the Apostles' Creed. As usual, let us begin with an opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our loving Father, we thank you for the gift of faith that moves us to follow Jesus, your son, our king, our shepherd who leads us to the waters of life. He knows our needs. He knows our struggles and our joys. We ask you now to help us deepen this part of our faith where we know that our home is really not here on earth, but there in heaven where he has gone ahead of us. May we journey on well through all the struggles of the world, never losing the focus of heaven. This is our prayer for our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you, the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends, once again, welcome to this, our continuation of the catechesis of the teaching. I think it is better of the conversation, the sharing about the Apostles' Creed. We have moved, have made some steps on this journey of deepening that what we believe. Last time, we dealt with something that uh, almost was confusing where we thought maybe when we say he descended into hell, we are thinking of that place of damnation, of condemnation of those who were not righteous. No, Jesus really died. He shared our humanity with whatever belongs to it and he descended to the realm of the dead, the way we all do when the pilgrimage here on earth has ended. And today, we are tackling that sixth uh, article, which we now call, He Ascended into Heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. I wish to handle this also in two parts. What we hear as the sentence goes, He Ascended into Heaven. That will be one part. And then the, uh, the second part will be, he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. We are speaking about, <clears throat> first, he, did, he ascended into heaven. And uh, we ought to keep in mind that uh, uh, the journey of Jesus can be characterized maybe in three moments. The first one, was being with God. That uh, is what the evangelist John gives us at the beginning, that the word was with God. And then there is another important fact, in fact, <laughs> the item or an article of faith, which is for us even uh, decisive. He was incarnate, that he became man and he dwelt among us. That is the second important thing. He descended to us, to our humanity, and he shared our humanity. He was with us, He's, he, he shared our life. He was mm -hmm. like us, but he never sinned. And then we now contemplate that uh, reality that he ascends to the Father. First, he descends into the depth of humanity, he was in the world, and then he ascends into the heights, into heaven. Like he descended into hell, ascended into heaven, doesn't mean that Jesus did something. We are now trying to rediscover the sense of poetry, a, a kind of a medium in which also some of these articles of faith have been formulated. So they, we have something like the mytho-poetic elaboration 
of the statement that he died. That is what we, we call he descended into hell. That was a poetical elaboration and representation of that fact that he shared our humanity to such an extent that he died, just as all human beings die. Now, so uh, he ascended into heaven, elaborates the statement that God raised him up, or in other words, he rose from the dead. It is now that this uh, articulation of the central part of our faith that he was raised up from the dead. He rose again, resurrection. This is now we see a visualization of the conviction of faith that Jesus Christ is risen and is with God. This is now where we are. Maybe we, before we, we do that, let us uh, read the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 6 to 12. It can help us also really to situate also this article of faith in Holy Scriptures. Acts 1, 6 to 12. When they had gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He answered them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him from their sight. While they were looking intently at the sky, as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white garments stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. This is now a contextualization of this article of faith. That when he was in the presence of his friends. He leaves this earth, this, this world, and was taken up to heaven. He ascends into heaven. In the ancient languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, heaven is not a place or a state. We only have here the image of the term heaven. So we use our creative imagination in a way to, to figure out what heaven would mean. Heaven, now we would even say from that, what I said beginning, that he descended into the depth of humanity and was with us, but then he came from somewhere. He was with God. So heaven can be now re, be referred to as the point of departure in Jesus. This is the point from which God's power breaks into the world. So we can even say heaven is God. This is something that we have to really deepen in order to understand, to contemplate heaven is, uh, is God, the realm of God. Jesus Christ as sent by God, remember the origin is from God, and also his being in the world was accompanied by the spirit of God. He, he himself is God on the human uh, at the same time. So, he is an ambassador of God's love. He comes from a point. So he is heaven sent. We have to keep that in mind. He now returns to the point of departure. After having accomplished the mission here on earth, we all let us always keep in mind that the accomplishment of his mission here on earth was with the, that terrible death on the cross. We have already uh, we have already talked about it, that he was crucified and died, was buried and descended into the realm of the dead. Now, he has accomplished the mission. St. John, the evangelist, will even uh, 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 report to us that one of the last words that Jesus says, it is accomplished. He has accomplished his mission. Now he returns. He goes back to that point of departure from where he came from, from God himself. 
the God sent ambassador goes back to the source from which God's love uh, gushes forth, uh, springs forth, and, uh, and uh, then permeates the whole world with the presence of Jesus. Now, that uh, heaven, even if we shall not say that it is a place or a state, maybe a state of being would, would describe, we are only describing because we are entering uh, like a mystery, a mystery of God, a state of perfect, uh, perfect joy, joy without limit. Here is where we are with God. And uh, it, he is going home to the Father, going home to the Father after accomplishing, accomplishing his mission. And we shall say, he is with God's life and he is in God. So this is where, now we, when we say that he ascended into heaven, we are believing, we are trying to formulate that what uh, we are deeply convinced of that after accomplishing his mission here on earth, he now goes back from where he came from, from that source, uh, from we, to that source from which God's love now is poured, was poured into the world. Jesus is with God. Here, we are approaching also the mystery of God. Remember when we believe, we, we agree that God is God and we are human beings. The difference is very clear. And yet, we know that there is one who has, who has shared both equally, without any mixture, without any confusion. And that is Jesus the Christ, sharing our humanity and yet maintaining his full divinity. The mystery of God. Now, when we approach mystery, we can only describe. We don't define. Because defining would mean you put an end to something. The fiend, uh, you find, uh, you put a meaning, you put a limit. And yet, the mystery of God, we cannot uh, anyway conclude it. We cannot put brackets on that. We just leave God to be God. But then, also the image heaven. Many of us, of course, it is like that. When they, they, they ask us now, where is heaven? We shall point upwards to the sky, to the blue sky, to the firmament. That is biblically speaking, to the firmament, to up. We look up. That when I will go up and I'm up there, then we will say that he, when he went, he went from down and he went uh, up. He came from heaven to earth to show us the way. And then through the cross, now he goes up to heaven. This firmament or the blue sky, we would say that there is something concealed and that is mystery. We are entering now the, the mysterious realm of God, the abode, uh, the abode of God uh, who is enthroned above the heavens, above what we see. This is just an image to put what anyway everybody would be familiar with, that when we talk of heaven, we are talking upwards, going upwards beyond the skies, and we are now the skies or the clouds, and this is also a biblical image that is put also in the gospels, that uh, they conceal the abode, the dwelling place of God who is enthroned above the heavens. We cannot see God, but then we experience the divine, uh, the, the divine presence uh, as a life force, that comes and to permeate the whole of the cosmos, the whole of the universe. God's presence is everywhere. You may not say necessarily that heaven is up. God's presence is everywhere. Because uh, since we cannot see him, we have the experience of this divine, divine presence, the divine blessing, which is like a life force that permeates the whole of being, the whole of creation, the universe. So the reason Christ is with God, is concealed with God. When he goes, we have heard from the Acts of the Apostles that he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. We don't see him, but we just believe he's concealed, he's hidden in God, he's with God, but his power to move human hearts, and this is what he lived it for. This is what he proclaimed, his power to move human hearts to compassion, to the respect of dignity of others, uh, to uh, 
that power that moves people to work for justice and for equality of all human beings continues to be at work in the world. And this is exactly where the point of witness and the missionary work will come in. Because Acts of the Apostles 1 has told us that he is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So when he goes to heaven, his presence, those that he had in fact uh, endowed and uh, empowered with his uh, life-giving spirit are now going to be witnesses of this power that moves human beings to compassion, to deepest respect of others. And this power is continuously at work in the world. And we would say that we are now uh, tackling the central meaning of this pa passage in the creed. He ascended into heaven. He is going, but he does not leave us as orphans. He leaves all his believers in the world empowered by the spirit so that they can continue his vision and a mission for the world. Let us go back maybe to that word, hidden. Hidden and concealed because we don't see God. He is out of sight, but yet we experience the God effect, which is the life-giving spirit in us. So we would even say that uh, sometimes we see the river flowing, but we don't, we don't see the spring. We don't see the source where it is coming. He's not seen. We see that it's a force driving that water to always be in motion. So this force from within, guiding all things, and uh, in a way pulse, pulse setting, and uh, like a heartbeat, the heartbeat coming uh, to us also. It is uh, like entering the world. A stream of life enters like uh, the world. We don't see this, this, uh, this uh, spring or the source, but we see the flow. The flow is, is, is still continuous. It is God's life in us, in the universe, but also in our in, innermost being. This is where we speak about God's divine life in, in us. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. The letter to the Colossians chapter three will tell us, our life is hidden in Christ, uh, with Christ in God. How hidden? In the sense of being hidden away for safekeeping and in God whose power is hidden in weakness. This will really disappoint us as human beings. God's power is hidden in weakness, yet it is stronger than human strength. This is what we find in the letter to, Corinth to the Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, we are hidden with Christ in God. When God is with, with Jesus is with God, we also know that the one who shared our humanity fully does not leave us alone and does not leave us in the same way that we were. We have been given this life-giving spirit that trans tra transforms us, but above all, empowering us all as human beings to work for heaven in the world. Heaven is that perspective where God is in control, giving life fully. And uh, all our prayers, especially the prayer of the, our Father, we always speak about the reality that is mission for the human beings. Those who have understood the power of Jesus given in the spirit to continue working for heaven so that heaven may be also visible here on earth so that the world may not remain a veil of tears where people are mourning, but it is possible to leave heaven if there is compassion, if there is kindness, if there is love, that power which transforms everything then we have a little bit of heaven. And I think we all need the desire for heaven. Jesus has gone ahead of us, he's with God, but we also know that we are hidden with him in God. We are in the world, but with another perspective. So the imperative for us would be open up a perspective of heaven, where you are in the world. Jesus ascends into heaven because he has given us a new perspective of how we are to look at things. And in fact, in the moments of revelation, when Jesus was made known to the world by the Father himself, 
not by anybody else, at baptism and at the transfiguration on the mountain, there is always an opening. A voice came from the clouds, from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. So a voice comes from heaven, from God, and we would say, this is my beloved son. That voice is heard at baptism, is heard at the transfiguration, to say that this <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth is the son of God, the beloved. But in him, we are also taken up uh, as beloved children without any discrimination. It is very interesting. During the transfiguration, <coughs> me, Peter wanted to stay at the, at the mountain, we are told. Master, it is beautiful. It is good to be here. Let me build the tents so that we can remain here. But Jesus says, we cannot remain here. We have to go down to Jerusalem. We, you have had a perspective now of this new life, of the resurrection. Take this perspective into the ordinary time. Descend now into the reality and then help everyone not to be caught up, not so much attached to this, to the view of things in the world, but always have the perspective of heaven. And that is why the friends of Jesus were asked, why are you looking? Standing here looking at the sky. And that, if I were there, I would have said, wait, dear friends, we need this gaze. We need this view. Because if we are too much preoccupied with the way the world sees things, then we, we are not moving forward. Now and again, we need another perspective, another view. And maybe this is exactly what happens in prayer, that we, we really go to heaven. Otherwise, what would we, we be doing in, in, in the prayer? At prayer, we encounter God. We are with God. So this is exactly where I would say it is possible to bring heaven to earth in all our limitedness. Not to say we have it and we make it ourselves because it is also given to us as a gift of grace, but we are there. We don't remain there where we have been in heaven in a prayer, where we have been transfigured. Everything is bright and white without any, any stain, but we are meant to go and bring good news. When we have good news, we can bring, we can bring heaven where, we, where there, is, there is on the world. So where, where people only think worldly, we can bring uh, heaven. And this good news, it is the command of the master, is to be brought to the very ends of the earth. That the whole earth needs to know that there is another perspective. There is another version of seeing things that the human beings have got also another version because their origin is heaven. They have a point of departure. And uh, when they have this experience that this life is on a journey, leading us now again to that point where we came from, from the source itself, then we know we can remain firm that he who died in our own absurdity as human beings, in our own brokenness, and it descends into the depth of our humanity, rises and it goes into heaven, to that point of departure where he came from. So my dear friends here, we can pause a bit and see if there is any question at this moment, we can also deal with it. But if not, then you will allow me to take the second part so that we, we have the questions or the sharings and the remarks at the end. So allow me then to go to that second part, which you say he sits or he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. When he is in heaven, when he is with God, we just say, uh, which position does he take up? We are now having another poetic image in a kind of a series of statements that unfold, that have been accompanying us as we are trying to spell out, to spell out the implication of Christ's resurrection. All of these poetic images want now to really make explicit this reality 
of Christ's resurrection. We say when he was raised from the dead, he was vindicated. Love that cannot be held captive in the grave. That is Christ's vindication. He rose from the dead. We have talked about the exaltation. He ascended, which means he is lifted beyond what is worldly and earthly and opens for us a perspective of heaven. And now it is coming as a climax, the, a, a climax of this movement that he who was vindicated by being raised from the dead and now ascends to the heights, the highest heavens, is now coming to a climax which we call empowerment. Empowerment and at the right hand of God. He's sitting enthroned. And here we see Christ holding ultimate power. And this power is the power of love. And in fact, this is the only ultimate power. It is a world changing power. Not only world changing, but reality changing power, the power of love. It is good that we are in this conversation on the solemnity of Christ the King. Christ's kingship, as he told us, is not of this world. If it were, he would have demonstrated his power. Instead, we see the king in powerlessness, in weakness. But now, when the climax of this movement comes, we see the power. He is seated at the right hand of God. This is the article, the second part of the article of faith we are talking about. When he ascends into heaven, his position is that of a king, that he is with God, seated and throned, holding, wielding, we would say, ultimate power in his hands. Power and authority has been handed over to him. Right hand of God. And this one will mean that Jesus Christ is God's right hand person. If you have ever heard of a powerful people, humanly speaking, they, can, they will even say, that one is my right hand person. A person that you, you can even leave and delegate to act on your own behalf. This is Jesus in the realm of God's transformative power of love. And he has the highest authority. And this highest authority of the one enthroned, seated at the right hand of the Father, God's right-hand person will be seen actualized in the next article of the Apostles' Creed, when we say that he is given authority to judge. Today in the Gospel, we talked about Jesus assuming his power, the Son of Man getting seated on that chair of his authority, and he begins to judge. His judgment is, of course, not the human one. He has given us all the criteria that he will use when he is judging. And we know all these criteria have to do with how we have cultivated our relationship, not only with God, but with our neighbor, especially those in need, those suffering. So the authority, the highest authority of Jesus will be uh, tackled in the next article of the Apostles' Creed, where we say, from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now he comes as the king to judge. So this article of, of, of the Apostles' Creeds, that he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, in fact, does not add any new information. Just to put the accent that this Jesus who was raised from the dead is in the realm of God. He is with God and he is seated there where his rightful place is with all authority. Our attention is only drawn to the implication of the faith we have in Christ as being alive and active. This is something that is very interesting, dear friends. When we, we say that Jesus is alive and active, where he is seated at the right hand of God the Father, in fact, we can even say that he is our advocate. We normally say, you are seated at the right hand of the Father and you 
plead our cause. You intercede for us. This is what this is what in fact we believe. He's there active, he's alive, he knows our needs, he knows our struggles, what we have gone through. And he has made it himself, he has felt it in his own flesh. He has suffered discrimination because of, of uh, being a fighter for justice. And uh, those are the struggles. And perhaps that is the content, the content of his prayer with the Father. The, the Gospel of John, I think it's chapter 17, where he himself speaks out the priestly prayer of Jesus. And I hope and I, I really believe that he, without ceasing, presents this prayer to the Father. May they be one, so that they may know that you sent me, so that they may know that they, the credibility of that what I've been telling them lies really from its origin with you. He's alive and he's active. So when we are here on earth and we believe that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the right hand person of God, the Father, then we know that all our efforts to live with the integrity, being guided by our inner light, the voice of the conscience, a conscience that is formed, in fact, by our own faith, you know, in the journey of faith, we, we are being formed so that our conscience can be, in a way, drawn closer to the one of Jesus. Just as St. Paul would say to the let, in the letter to the Philippians, that he pleads that we have the same mind like Christ, who humbled himself, the same mind, the same attitude, the way we see things, then we know that we can stand up for what Jesus stood for. And this would be justice, it will be love, it will be compassion. And that is exactly to say Jesus is alive and Jesus is active. Here, when we are talking about Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, we can be helped in a way to make a difference between authority and authoritarianism. Authoritarianism, in a way, is something that people play around with here on earth. It will be like a pseudo or a false authority that counts only in this world. And we know that is limited. One time it will have an end. And that is why many people, especially when they have false pseudo, pseudo uh, authority, they will try by all means to fight for it because it can be taken away from them. And that is that, uh, the authoritarianism. On the other hand, a person with authority a person who has authentic authority uses the power to empower us. And here we are talking about also an earlier article that we, 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 we had a conversation over when we said that Jesus is Lord. The Lord Jesus, his only son, our Lord Jesus. We saw it earlier. So he has the power that empowers us, that does not humiliate them, that does not remove power from them, making them powerless, and then ready to be manipulated by any uh, of those who have pseudo, uh, pseudo authority, false authority. This is authentic authority because it has been used to empower others. And in fact, uh, the other difference will lie in, in the, the reality that authoritarianism grooms fake people because they want to please the one who has limited power. But then uh, authority, authentic authority grooms empowered individuals who are very conscious about their obligations, but are also about their rights. The Father Almighty is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. I remember also to have talked about this. Remember what has been, what comes first, Father Almighty, not Almighty Father. It could also be, but Father Almighty. We are not talking about here about a kind of autocratic potentate, a kind of a person with a, who is so obsessed by. By authority and power, but we are talking about 
a caring, loving father. He's almighty. I love something really I heard one time that God is almighty, but not alone mighty. Because he is a father who wants his children to grow. He wants now his children to be mature partners, mature partners in a relationship that they can, uh, they can now relate to a father who gives them life, who cares for them. And this is a, now where you say he's, he's having authority, but he has it only in the name of love, which is all powerful. And he has proved that this love is really all powerful, the power of love. He has lived it here on earth by enduring suffering because of the injustice and the affliction that led to his death. So he had a strong love, a great love that was ready to bear the great suffering of Calvary. So he is one who suffers injustice, affliction, and even death, but he does it lovingly, and this gives meaning. And what has helped many people, those especially who have suffered, we hear of those who were subjected to, the, to that utmost suffering, especially in the concentration camps during the Nazi regime, one thing kept them going and kept them alive. That was the hope and the meaning. They had meaning in life. So Jesus, when he lovingly suffers, he has meaning. And he endures that because of the authority of his love. He's, he's authentic in his love. It's not superficial. He is really at the core of what we call love. Ready? to give his life for the others. And the book of Revelation will say that that place that we, we, we believe Jesus to be having at the right hand of the Father, they say, and I saw a lamb, and all power was given to the lamb that was sacrificed. And this is exactly Jesus, the Paschal lamb. So when we, we are making this transition, we are moving with Jesus, uh, teaching us about a new order the world, a new vision, God's vision for the world, but then also aware that living this vision will not win as many fans. There will be rejection, but he himself, the Lamb of God that suffered, is now enthroned as the Messiah and knows uh, the secret uh, plans of God in his authority of love. What is the implication of this article of faith for us? That he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. First of all, we have to really appreciate the dignity of the human. We are talking about human. Being human is something with a dignity. Why? Because the Son of God, Jesus Christ, shared our humanity. He added value to our being human and we, in fact, we have to be very proud of that. Jesus, who becomes human in order to empower us and to show us how we can be human. So the imperative for us would be, be empowered by love, to stand for what Jesus stood for. And this, in a, the gospel today, the Matthew chapter 25, has told us how we can really stand for what he stood for to comfort the sick, to feed the hungry, to embrace the unloved, to replace indifference with the caring. That is where we are now called to say when we are empowered people, also in our limitation as human beings, we shouldn't be afraid of our limitations and our weaknesses, but we do what we can. We do what we can in our limitedness, but then we know that empowered by this love, we shall imitate the master himself. We shall not only admire, but we imitate what was important for him. So we can see that in Jesus seated at the right hand of God, we see our brother, we see the human sitting at the right hand of God. This is a human dignity, the human that he comes and takes on our humanity so that he may share with us his divinity, the human at the right hand of God. And in fact, when uh, we, we talk about uh, Mary also assumed 
into heaven. Remember the difference. Jesus ascends into heaven. He's God. But Mary is assumed, is taken, is taken up into heaven as the human being, a human being now lifted up to that glory of the resurrection. But if we first see it in Jesus who shared our humanity par excellence. So human form has been raised and glorified. And this is now the state or the dignity that can never be destroyed. Jesus is where, is there where human dignity is preserved and in a way completed. Because the journey begins with this being human here on, uh, on earth, but then it will move on when God now is all in all, giving now the human dignity, that goal of life that all human beings long for, especially if they are really uh, having the desire to be human. So I would say that Jesus is the archetype, the archetype, or we could call it the original type, or we could say, it's difficult to put in words, we say the archetypal human, the human that was humiliated by the powers, humiliated by the powers, but exalted by God, to the position of highest power, and this reminds us, the mighty ones in the world uh, deal with the oppressed and they exploit them in many ways in the world. There are many deformed existences. If we speak of the human dignity that Jesus now takes, takes with him and is seated at the right hand of God the Almighty, the Father Almighty, and then we, we think of the many deformed existences, human existences, deprived of all dignity, then we, we know that our faith in this glorified Lord who is seated at the right hand of God will make uh, of us a command to do what he did, to stand on the side of the exploited, of the oppressed in our world today. So this is the journey that we are all making. If Jesus, the human, has made this journey that led him to be there with God in his highest authority of love, then the love, even if it is limited that I have in my limited heart, in my weak heart, the love that you have also in your own brokenness and weakness can do a lot, transform the face of the earth. Let us remember, that when Jesus was born, Bethlehem, the angels sang, glory to God in the highest heaven and a peace to people of goodwill. If we are Christians, we must be people of goodwill, having a, that as a mission that he who has shared our struggles and what we are going through and has empowered us with his Holy Spirit gives us the hope of eternally being with him in his glory. I thank you very much for following. I know you are good followers and you are also good partners of the conversation. Now at this moment, I will welcome some questions so that we are in a conversation, we clarify where possible and then you make also your own remarks. I thank you. Anyone who is online can, uh, can give us his or her remarks. Yeah, that silence uh, for me is a sign, well, I don't know how to interpret it, but it's a sign that we, we can also conclude. And uh, the conclusion, dear friends, from me would be that we should be encouraged in a way to be rooted in the knowledge of what we believe. But then what we believe should not only make us pious, but also active agents for God's own kingdom. God's kingdom uh, must be a reality or else we, 
we make God just a dreamer. Because if we pray, you may your kingdom come, then it should really come where people are ready to dialogue with one another in dignity. Everybody has the dignity. The giftedness may, may differ, but we have that common factor which has been given to us. We are human, and that is a gift that God has given us, created in his image. This image will be fulfilled when we are to encounter him face to face in that eternal uh, uh, presence where there is joy without limit. Christ has gone ahead of us, and may that joy always strengthen our hope that we are not on a journey that will lead us into nothing. It will be a reunification. And this we live even now. When we cultivate our moments of prayer and we encounter God, we should always long for that encounter. And then from the encounter with God, we draw strength to really make our places of influence better places for life. So my dear friends, I thank you very much and I look forward to being again with you as we, we, we make our journey ahead, dealing with the, the, next, the next article of the Apostles' Creed. I thank you for your interest and uh, I wish that now we conclude with a prayer and a blessing. To you, loving Father, be glory, power, and the majesty. Be God in our lives and help us to avoid any temptation of usurping your place, your power in our own lives and in the lives of others. Help us not to play God in the people, in the lives of other people. May Christ be our King, leading us to that beautiful goal of the journey that you have prepared for us to lead for our own transformation. And through us, Lord, with your spirit, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, make us ready to give our contribution for a better world in solidarity and a fraternity. This is our prayer through Christ the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father. The Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless and protect you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. May you may God bless and protect you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. May you may God bless and protect you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. May you rest in bless and protect you. Yes, I believe everlasting Son of God. Yes, I believe. Yes, I believe. Mighty Father, Mother, Son. Yes, 
Yes, I believe in the sun and in the spirit. 